Now we will move on to our third presentation. It is on changing dynamics in the global environment, the story of Pakistan. The presenter is Major General Mohammed Shamiz Salik. He is the Director General, Institute for Strategic Studies, Research and Analysis, National Defense University, Pakistan. A quick um, short introduction uh, on the general. He's a graduate of Command and Staff College and National Defense University, Islamabad. His, his master's in Welf Warfare, Defense and Strategic Studies and has done him fill in public policy and strategic security management. During his 29 years of service, General has served on a number of commands, staff and instructional appointments, which includes the instructor at Pakistan Military Academy, Kakul, uh, Brigade Major of Infantry Brigade, UN Military Observer, Staff Officer at Military Secretary Branch, Assistant Private Secretary to the Chief of Army Staff, General Staff Officer, uh, Grade 1 at Military Operations Directorate, Directing Staff at Armed Forces, War College, and Chief of Staff of Corps. The General Command did his parent artillery regiment, artillery brigade, infantry brigade, infantry division, and his, and his previous appointments was vice chief of general staff at the general headquarters at Raval Pindi. He is currently serving as the director general of the Institute of Strategic Studies and Research Analysis, National, National Defense University in Islamabad. Over to you, General. Vice Chancellor, Honorable Chair, ladies and gentlemen, Subha good morning and Assalamu Alaikum. Good afternoon, sorry. I am thankful to the KDU administration for affording me an opportunity to dilate upon the subject and speak about the story of Pakistan, which is the punchline. Most of the things that I will say today are based on practical experience of Pakistan Armed Forces in fight against terrorism, as well as my personal experience of 33 years. Given the short time at my disposal, I would dwell upon the subject in the sequence as shown on the slide. Ladies and gentlemen, the prevailing strategic environment is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. While the technology is driving volatility and complexity, the economic conditions are increasingly growing uncertain. All this is encompassed in a political and diplom diplomatic ambiguity. Hence, I would rather avoid predicting the future as there are too many trends being driven by amb ambiguous drivers. So what best we should do is to carry out an objective and pragmatic analysis of the environment, however it is likely the despondency may exude from a dispassionate review of environment currently being faced by us. Large transformations are taking place, which impact everyone on the planet, with Pakistan being no exception. Each of these mega trends is important of its own right, but they are also closely related to one another. Firstly, we see that a significant rebalancing of power with uni unipolar world transiting to multipolarity. With extraordinary technological advancements, productivity is increasing manifold. However, rise of unemployment, inequalities, and impoverishment could be the consequences. Globalization being a stark reality has to a degree challenge the power and autonomy of a nation state, initially due to influence of IFIs and NSA. Despite, despite various initiatives to eradicate terrorism, violent non-state actors like Daesh, Al-Qaeda, like Daesh, Al-Qaeda, and TTP would continue to pose formidable threat to the world's stability. With a reduced 
possibility of large-scale interstate wars, the character of conflict will continue to be dominated by conflict of interest. Print, electronic, and particularly the social media will continue, no, it's okay, I'm sorry. Will continue, print, electronic, and particularly the social media will continue to play an important role in creating desired perceptions. There is an increasing global acceptance to the use of responsibility to protect humanitarian invention and lawfare as an intervention tools. Restraining from intervention in Kashmir, Rwanda, Palestine, and Syria are examples of selective application of R2P. The, possi the possibility of negative game changers termed as black swans could be, could not be ruled out and these are as shown on the slide. Ladies and gentlemen, in the regional context, there are several geopolitical divergences of interest. The tumultuous situation in Kashmir, Afghanistan, Syria, Yemen, and recent diplomatic row between Saudi Arabia and Qatar are case in point. Moreover, the existing conventional force differentials have the potential to start an arms race in the region which Pakistan can neither afford nor has an appetite for, for it. On the contrary, South Asia has a great potential to, for trade between other regions of the world. We believe that South Asia and Central Asian regions offer great prospects for economic cooperation. Chinese initiative of One Belt, One Road and CPAC could be the game changers and many more could be the game changers not only for Pakistan but for the entire region. Yet another area of opportunity is the collaborative approach to security. No one nation alone can single-handedly tackle the multitude of threats. And amongst the regional countries, Pakistan had taken the lead to join the coalition of willing to fight against terrorism and extremism. Now coming to the punchline, and I will take a little more time on this. Pakistan has a history of doom and gloom Located at the confluence of South Asia, Central Asia, Middle East, and Persian Gulf, Pakistan has remained and is still at the center stage of global power struggles. The Soviet invasion of Afghanistan left enduring marks on our collective psyche, playing havoc with our fragile socio-political and economic culture structure, thus stabilizing the region. Allow me to briefly dilate upon the genesis of the problem. After Soviet invasion, Mujahideen, then seen as an asset from all over the world, poured into Afghanistan. The region became vulnerable to the exploitation by hostile internal and external powers for vested interests. Pakistan, being the next door neighbor, was expected to act, act as the frontline state to, uh, to fight the Soviets on behest of the US. First impact was, the, uh, was that Pakistan had to embrace <coughs> over three million war-torn Afghan refugees with open arms. Eastman rights were granted to them to cross over Pak Afghan border without any documents. The influx of Afghan refugees had economic and security repercussions. Here it is important to understand the dynamics of geography. Much of the 2,611 kilometer long porous Pak Afghan border is remote, mountainous, and inaccessible, making it difficult to keep proportional physical presence all along. The area is characterized by tribes, divided villages, divided families, and even divided houses. Intermarriages and informal cross-border trade is a common practice. This tribal belt also became the sanctuary of concentration, tra concentration training and launch pad of Mujahideen, not only for Afghanistan, but volunteers from other countries to fight communism. Besides all sorts of material support from the allies, Mujahideen were trained and equipped with arms, ammunition, and famous American Stinger missiles. This led to gun running and emergence of Klashenkov culture in the region, poppy cultivation flourished, and narcotics and drug trafficking started affecting the entire world. Ladies and gentlemen, US won the Cold War, Soviets withdrew from Afghanistan, whereas Pakistan was left high and dry. Pakistan was the frontline state uh, uh, in the fight against terrorism, in, in the fight against Soviets, 
Freedom fighters from other nationalities were not accepted back by their parent countries. By 1990s, the area had developed into a hotbed of extremism. I must say that the seeds of terrorism were sown at that time. Inept handling of same very Mujahideen converted them into terrorists, and they turned against Pakistan. And ladies and gentlemen, this is not a Pakistan narrative. Please see the video. We also have a history of kind of moving in and out of Pakistan. I mean, let's remember here, the people we are fighting today, we funded 20 years ago. And we did it because we were locked in this struggle with the Soviet Union. They invaded Afghanistan, and we did not want to see them control Central Asia. And we went to work. And it was President Reagan, in partnership with the Congress, um, led by Democrats, who said, you know what, sounds like a pretty good idea. Let's deal with the ISI and the Pakistani military, and let's go recruit these Mujahideen. And let's great, let's get some to come from Saudi Arabia and other places, importing their Wahhabi brand of Islam so that we can go beat the Soviet Union. And we, guess what? They retreated. They lost billions of dollars, and it led to the collapse of the Soviet Union. So there's a, a very strong argument, which is it wasn't a bad investment to end the Soviet Union, but let's be careful what we sow because we will harvest. So we then left Pakistan. We said, okay, fine, you deal with the stingers that we've left all over your country. You deal with the mines that are along the border. And by the way, we don't want to have anything to do with you. In fact, we're sanctioning you. So we stopped dealing with the Pakistani military and with ISI, and we now are making up for a lot of lost time. Okay, now ladies and gentlemen, now we move fast forward to 2001. The horrific incident of 9-11 forced Pakistan to take an unavoidable policy decisions which exposed the country to lethal lash out from terrorist outfits. Once again, Pakistan found itself to be standing at the frontline state to fight militancy on the behest of the US and entire world. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, during this period, Pakistan and Pakistani people have made huge sacrifices. The economic, social, and cultural losses made by Pakistan are unimaginable. I must highlight that the US has spent over 160 billion US dollars in Afghanistan not even a fraction of the same has been provide, provided to Pakistan. Despite our limited resources and with only a modicum of international support, Pakistan nation has achieved unparalleled successes, but at a very high, heavy price. We have lost over 60,000 lives and economic losses are to the tune of 118 billion US dollars. <clears throat> now this slide, shows some of the senior ranking officers who embraced Shahadat. There is one three star, three two stars, and six or seven, uh, six here, uh, shown here. One star, that is Brigadier. as. The irony is that while Pakistan is doing every bit, the world is not satisfied. Rather than fulfilling its obligations in Afghanistan, Pakistan is being pressured to do more. The mantra is repeated every now and then, Please watch the clip. And yeah, now, let's take another question quick. What's the last? Yeah, please go ahead. My name is Shamama. I'm uh, representing the Women Chamber of uh, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. Uh, my question will be more focused about my own uh, province, of course. We all know that uh, whole of Pakistan is facing the brunt of uh, whatever is happening and, and trying to cooperate with the U.S. and somehow U.S. Um, is like, is a, is a, is a mother-in-law which is just not satisfied with us <laughs> and comes up with <laughs> new ideas. <laughs> okay, now, <clears throat> going further, ladies and gentlemen, here, I would like to highlight few achievements made by our government and the security force, forces. Since 2001, Pakistan Army has conducted 177 major and 266 minor operations to sanitize the area and dismantle terrorist safe havens. These uh, include combing, blockade, sting, cordon, and search operations and surgical strikes. 
uh, <coughs> even right now, as I speak, there are operations, and a very major operation is, is ongoing on Park Afghan border. Now, this was the state of uh, area in 2008. You see red color, you see yellow color, and you see green color. Green color is under government control, yellow color is contested, and red color is militant control. And see the, this, the same very map as of now. Complete area is green color. So these safe havens have been removed and they have now shifted to the Afghan side. Around 10,000 terrorists of all hues and colors, including 757 foreigners have been killed, 700 Al-Qaeda operators were apprehended. About 15 operations were conducted in support of coalition forces. Pakistan Air Force is flying regular combat missions to support ground forces. In the maritime domain, Pakistan Navy has raised a new task force to guard against non-traditional threats. Local paramilitary forces, uh, frontier constabulary and police have been expanded and better equipped. 821 check posts, this is the disparity have been established as compared to 120 only on the front side. Besides selective fencing over 32 kilometers, immigration control measures have been instituted at all the entry and exit points. Writ of the government has been established as it has been shown on the map, barring few suicide attacks, ID blasts, and indiscriminate firing miscreants operating from hideouts inside Afghanistan continue to attack soft targets, including a school which was attacked in 2015, and law enforcement agencies. Here I would like to show you some glimpses, pictures of their hideouts and large cashier farms, ammunition and explosive recovered by the law enforcement agencies. Besides the military prong, a lot has been done on the political, legal, economic, and infrastructure development uh, side. Reform package was announced by the president on 14th of August 2009 for integration of Atta region. Madrasa Education Authority has been set up to improve curriculum registration and monitoring of activities. Regional Counterterrorism Authority has been established to formulate counterterrorism policies and to coordinate intelligence amongst uh, different agencies. In the next few slides, I would like to show you the glimpses of some of the de-radicalization de efforts and infrastructure development work undertaken by the government, <laughs> spearheaded by the military. You can, on left side, you can see before and now after that. This also uh, includes a focus on the, the, on the women folk. Now coming over to some of the humble contributions made by Pakistan towards global and regional peace. Pakistan is amongst the largest contributors of peacekeepers in the world. Pakistan has so far contributed more than 169,000 peacekeepers in 42 different missions across 23 countries. 145 Pakistani peacekeepers have laid down their lives, which is testimony to its commitment towards promoting noble cause of global peace. Under the ambit of US-led coalition maritime forces, Pakistan Navy is actively contributing in the maritime security operations as part of combined task forces 150 and 151 since 2004 and 2009 respectively holding up multinational maritime exercise Aman on alternate years since 2007 is also a step in this direction. Ladies and gentlemen, there are some min major unresolved issues between some of the neighboring countries, including the core issue of Kashmir, which remains the unfinished agenda of partition between Pakistan and India. Kashmiris are still awaiting the right of self-determination in accordance with the UN Security Council resolutions passed in 1949. The composite dialogue process needs to progress beyond peripheral issues like promotion of some confidence measures, confidence building measures, and cultural exchanges. Regional cooperation forums like SARC also have become hostage to politics. Unless uh, reactivated, SARC and other bilateral and multilateral agreements outside SARC are much need for peace and economic well-being of the region. We all know that injustice further breeds injustice 
whereas the aim should be to eradicate the injustices. Even legitimate freedom struggle of, in Kashmir has been lumped together with terrorism. Now, a few lines on the future vision of Pakistan. Ladies and gentlemen, a few words uh, about the future. Pakistan has embarked upon a comprehensive framework named as VN 2025 to steer the country towards prosperity and development. The VN 2025 has identified seven pillars of growth and development, and these pillars are shown on the slide. We do realize that the external and internal challenges can only be addressed by having a sound economic base. With the help of our Chinese friends, we have started the CPAC project, which is extension of Chinese OBOR project, consolidating and expanding the scope of cooperation from dependency to comprehensive strategic partnership is an imperative for Pakistan. Now, to conclude, I would like to say that contemporary Pakistan has been quite frequently misread and misrepresented as a state and mischaracterized as a society. However, in the face of a relentless assault on our traditional values and culture, the Pakistani nation has been a symbol of incredible resolve and faith in the nobleness of human spirit, from its humble beginning to reaching a prominent place in the comity of nations. Pakistanis, like our Sri Lankan friends, have proven themselves to be a progressive, peace-loving, enterprising, vibrant, and resilient nation. With friends and partners like you, I am confident that we are all set to rise higher together. Thank you very much. Long live Pakistan-Sri Lanka friendship. Thank you, uh, General Shami Salik.